I'm going to present some positive and negative learnability results that we can directly get from this definition of uh, Occam's razor. And then we'll see other Occam's razors later. In particular, the first class of functions we'll consider, and this is also the answer to the question on Zoom, how do we know the size of H? Well, we consider classes of functions. The first class of, class of functions we'll consider is the set of all possible conjunctions. A conjunction, just to remind you, is uh, something like that might look like this. Let me use a different. So you may have x1 and x2 is a conjunction. The output is true if both x1 and x2 are true. x1 and not x2 is also a conjunction. The output is true if x1 is true and x2 is false. x1 by itself is a conjunction. It's a conjunction with just one item, one uh, element. Or you can have x1 and not x2 and x3 and so on. So hopefully things that are not conjunctions might be x1 or x2. x1 or x2 is saying the output is true. Either x1 or x2 is true. Something else that's not conjunction is x1 or x2 and x3. The output is true if x3 is true and one of x2 and x1 and x2 are true. These are not conjunctions. Okay. So the question here uh, to think about is to show that this, well, to check whether this is pack learnable or not, what do we need to do? For pack learnability, just to remind you, the number of examples needed needs to be polynomial, polynomial in 1 over epsilon, 1 over delta, the size of h, and the dimensionality. Now let's look at this expression here. The number of examples is already polynomial in 1 over epsilon. It's less than polynomial in 1 over delta. It's less than polynomial in the size of uh, the hypothesis space. The only thing missing here is the dimensionality. So we need to somehow connect this expression to the dimensionality. How many conjunctions exist if you have n features? The question is, how are examples chosen? The answer is they are assumed to be drawn IID from some fixed distribution. All this. So now the question, let's, uh, I heard an answer and I'm going to ask someone else to answer. Um, how many conjunctions are there in with N features? Because if we can answer that question, we'll connect the size of H and N and we'll get an expression in terms of N. Yes. Uh, if we need N. Why? Because uh, for every single uh, variable we have, okay, we have N variables, mm -hmm. uh, we have three options. And what are they? It's either uh, the, the, the regular one, uh, the not measure and the not measure. Yes, that's right. So the way I think about this is there's a uh, there's a question on uh, the epsilon and delta part for this example. In fact, uh, I'll come back to this question on Zoom because uh, we I'll I'll work through an example that illustrates epsilon and delta. But to count the number of conjunctions, you can ask what is a conjunction? It has if you have n features, there are n. Think of this as there are n positions to be filled up. Each one of them can have, you can either put an x1, you can either put an x1 here, or you can put a negated version of an x1. Together, these two are called uh, literal. The literal can either be by itself or with a negation, or you don't put an x1 there. Empty. If I, similarly, I can put an x2 here, or not x2, or just want to put a dash, meaning it's not there. There's no x2. x3, not x3. Let's say we have only four because I'm getting bored of writing this. Now, if the I can choose each column here independently. So let's say that I choose uh, x, not x1, and I choose not to put the x2. Let's say I choose x3, and so I get x1 x3 and these two slots disappear so i get x1 and x3 
Oh, did I not X1 and X2? In this procedure, with this procedure, I can every choice of one of these things gives me a different <laughs> conjunction, which means I can create every possible conjunction this way. I have three choices for each slot, and there are n slots, so I have three power n possible conjunctions. Any questions? We did a similar sort of thing for monotone conjunctions before. With monotone conjunctions, the middle row disappears. The negated features no longer exist. So for every position, either the feature shows up or it does not. So you get two power there because you get two choices for every position. Yes. Um, couldn't it also be like you want to, or is it different than the, the binary? Yes, the, the counting argument is slightly different. This is a different style of an argument. Yeah. Um, does it have to be polynomial in all of those? It has to be a polynomial in all of them. Oh. Yes. A monotone conjunction is a conjunction that does not allow negation. No, no feature should be negated. Okay, so uh, we have three power n conjunctions. The only thing that matters, so size of h is three power n. The only thing that really matters is the log of that. I uh, uh, Someone asked me after the class, uh, I sometimes write log log, sometimes I, I typeset it as ln, natural log, uh, in everything except the uh, discussion about entropy, I always assume natural log. I just tend to be lazy to write, uh, I don't know, I'm just used to writing log. So log size of h is, Basically, n, see, I'm writing ln here, 3, which is this quantity is order of n. So that means this expression, let's rewrite that expression. The number of examples needed is if you have more than 1 over epsilon times n log 3 plus log 1 over delta examples, then any conjunction that's consistent with the data set will have an error less than epsilon on future examples and with probability. This statement is holds with probability 1 minus delta. Assuming, of course, that the true function also is a conjunction. Because we are assuming that the concept class, this is the discussion here is essentially about whether a concept class is learnable or not. So uh, at this point, you know, this seem, this may seem a little too abstract. So let me uh, uh, illustrate this using some worked out examples. So let's say that I want a 95% chance uh, of learning a hypothesis that is 99% accurate. But 95, so let's start with the 90% oh, accurate. 90% accurate means epsilon is 0.1. I'm willing to tolerate an error of 0.1. I want the the, the possibility of learning succeeding, I want it to be more than 95%. Meaning, on 95% of the cases, I want a classifier that has 90% uh, uh, accuracy. This means delta is 0 0.05. And let's say that I have um, n Boolean features, n equals 10. I can literally plug this in. And uh, if you plug it, the whole thing in, you'll see it works out to about 140. So what this says is, if you have 140 examples that are constructed from uh, from 10 uh, that are that are labeled by some conjunction, and you you have a learning algorithm that can find a conjunction that is consistent with all 140 of them then that particular conjunction will make fewer than 10% errors in, uh, on, on unseen examples with some uh, margin for uh, error. Oh, sorry, with, with, with some, and this statement, what I just said, has a possibility of being false because it's possible that your 140 examples might not be a good representative of the true data. You might get really unlucky and that might happen 5% of the time. 
questions and this was also uh, related to the question on zoom so maybe you can also follow up on this yes why do i have a base i i don't oh here yes the three comes from the conjunction yeah so we decided that uh, we saw two examples of attack uh, vulnerability based on the side of the hypothesis uh, space. Yes. Is there any case where uh, we might need to decide whether the 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 attack vulnerable or not based on the one by epsilon and one? No, because one by epsilon and one by delta are already polynomial in this uh, expression. So that's the strength of this theorem. This theorem really gives you. Uh, sort of a shortcut for testing pack learnability. All you need to do is count the number of functions and plug it in. So there, there is no case that those two terms might be non-polynomial. Not here. Yes. Other questions? Okay, so we have this expression here. Let's say that uh, I, I'm, I'm not with this 90% error, um, Sorry, uh, this this case of ninety percent error and uh, ninety five percent confidence. I need this, but now my the number of features I have is not ten, but hundred. If you plug in hundred there, you get you go from hundred and forty to about one thousand. So the number of examples needed clearly is goes up linearly in the dimensionality. Here the intuition is that if you have more features, you need more examples to kind of give you confidence that what you have is a good classifier. This is a, a motivation for not adding randomly, uh, not adding all possible features you can think of because adding more features places a bigger burden on the size of the data set that's needed. Now, suppose rather than increasing, the, in, in addition to increasing the dimensionality to 100, um, oh, by the way, this, this statement holds for any consistent learner. I have not talked about any learning algorithm here, right? Any learner, any algorithm that can produce a conjunction that's consistent with a set of examples will satisfy the property. It doesn't matter what that algorithm does in turn, which is kind of a, a cool statement. It, this is a statement about every possible algorithm that can produce a consistent learner. It doesn't matter how it works internally. If it guarantees consistency, it's going to have low errors. Yes. This is all assuming that our data is clean, right? This is assuming that our data is clean. Another way of saying that is this is assuming that Every example in our data is labeled by a conjunction. If it was not clean, it would be labeled by something that's not a conjunction. Yes. Uh, we have that inequality from our previous slides. And then uh, to prove that the general conjunctions act memorable, we should prove that this is a polynomial of the term that we define. Did you prove that? that did, did, what did I, I? I didn't understand your question. Can you repeat that? We should prove that uh, uh, actually n is a polynomial function of those terms. Ah, yes. So, so let's uh, let's work this through. So, uh, I did actually. So m, the num, if I have polynomial examples in the in one over epsilon, one over delta, n, and the size of the hypothesis space, then I have a fact learnable. So m, the number of examples needed. If I have more than these many, I'm, I'm uh, uh, by definition, this is factual. You don't. You didn't do that for general conjunctions. These are general conjunctions. Because the number of general conjunctions is. So let me walk. Over. So the number of general conjunctions, size of H, is 3 power m. So log of size of H is n log 3. And I just plug this in here and I get an expression for the sample complexity. You don't look convinced. Yeah, I, I know, but you use exactly the same expression that we proved last session and just put. Uh, yeah, that's all I did. The size of H. That's it. And just... That's it. This expression, the, the Occam's razor theorem, is essentially a tool for proving pack learnability in this case, because it simplifies all these other dependencies. And the only thing we need to worry about is the size of the hypothesis space. Yes. Is it possible to use this for um, like linear 
classifiers or like um, linear regressions? Um, so the, the definition here is only for classification, first of all. So let's focus on linear classification. How many linear classifiers exist? It's infinite. Why does this theory not work? Remember, the first step that we had in this when building this theorem was let's assume we have a finite hypothesis. A finite hypothesis. This only works if you have a finite hypothesis space. We'll get to the infinite hypothesis space uh, after the spring break. I'll take a question on Zoom and then I'll come back. Is there any need to prove polynomial for variables other than n? It seems like the other three are kind of a given. That's right. The epsilon, the one over epsilon and the one over delta part just counts for free. The polynomial, the, the fact that it's polynomial in size of H also comes for free because it just comes out of this. So the only thing we need to prove uh, poly, is polynomial is the log of the size of the hypothesis space. So essentially, in this setting, if the log of the size of the hypothesis space is polynomial in the dimensionality, we are done. It's back theorem. If the log of the size of the hypothesis space is not polynomial in the dimensionality, then it's not back theorem. Question. Um, so I know you have to find this one a little bit confused. So with the consistent learning, uh, it's saying that it produces a hypothesis that's consistent with the training. Method. Yes. What are we defining as consistent with the training? When, when I say consistent with the training set, what I mean is for every example in the training set, the hypothesis produces a label that is the ground truth. So the hypothesis and the true function agree with each other. So when I say consistent with the training set, what I really mean is the hypothesis is consistent with the oracle function on the training set, on every example of the training set. What would we be overfitting in that case? That's right. We might be overfitting, provided the size of the function space is the hypothesis space is too large. If the size of the hypothesis space is small, the chance of overfitting goes down. That's literally what the theorem is proving. That's exactly what it's proving. If the size of the hypothesis space is large, that means that you, no matter how complicated the function is, including what the, the noise in the data, you will find something that fits. And that's why you go it. But if your hypothesis space is small, then it's, it's a remarkable accident that you explain the noise because there isn't enough capacity, and this is a technical term, there isn't enough capacity in these functions to explain everything. So it could not possibly be explaining noise, so it must be explaining only the thing. And that's the intuition for choosing smaller hypothesis spaces. Okay, so let's, uh, let's take one more example here. Um, what I did was I increased the dimensionality from 10 to 100, and I say that uh, the the guarantee here is I want the, I, I can be 95% confident that my learning succeeds. What if I want to be 99% confident? That means delta becomes uh, 0.01 mm -hmm. and there's a logarithmic dependence on uh, delta, on one over delta. And so you pay a slightly more higher cost. You need to go from, uh, it's basically the same order of same number of examples. So you pay with a, for a few more examples, you get more confidence that your learning will succeed. Let's look at one more function class uh, where that is back learnable, and then we'll look at a function class that's not back learnable. And then I'll not go through the details and I'll just give you, uh, uh, present some results. This function class is called 3CNF, stands for three conjunctive normal forms. How many people have seen conjunctive normal forms before? Uh, not a big number. and. Uh, it's uh, one of those things that you'll see in, I don't know what class, uh, in algorithms. You, you definitely see in algorithms, but uh, in essentially, if you kind of start taking enough theory classes in CS, you stumble across uh, CNFs. And the reason uh, pack learnability and all these things uh, are studied with these classes of functions is because all of this, this theory was also invented by people who do computer science theories. So they like these kinds of functions. And the good news is uh, with these kinds of functions, we can also uh, play the counting game um, in the class. So I'll define this class of functions and then I'll count how many three CNFs are there. 
a, a, a CNF in general is a function that is an AND of OS. So, you, so the L, L1, 1, L1, 2, and these things are literals. A literal is either something like xi or a negation. So negations are allowed. So you have something, a variable or its negation. You take a disjunction of some subset of them, and that thing is called a conjunct. We have two conjunct conjuncts here. This is one. We have two conjuncts here. Each one of them is itself a disjunction. It's an or of things. So let me give you some examples of CNFs. Um, so or three CNFs. A three CNF is simply one where each conjunct can have at most three literals. So let me give you examples of things that are three CNFs and things that are not three CNFs. So I can have x1 or not x2 and x3. This is a three CNF because this conjunct here has less than or equal to three literals. Negation tarala. This conjunct here has less than or equal to three literals. It has only one. So it's a three CNF. I can have x1 or not x2 or x3 and x2 or not x4. There are three uh, things that are, uh, you take an or of three things and you take an or of two things, which make it a little bigger. And you have an or of three things here. This is a 3CNF, this is a 3CNF. Let's write one that's not. This is an AND. Uh, the, the, the AND is inside, so it's not a 3CNF. Another thing that's not a 3CNF is X1 or X2 or X3 or X4. And it's not a 3CNF because there are four things here. So this, everything below the line that I'm drawing is not a 3CNF. This is just a class of functions. I mean, it's a, it's a complicated class of functions, but it's a class of functions. And this has some interesting uh, connections to certain algorithmic properties that is the reason why this gets studied. But for our purposes, let's pretend that nature chooses its oracle function from the set of all possible 3CNFs. And the question that we have to answer is, is this concept class fact learnable in this consistent case? Okay. Any questions about this function class before we move on? Because there are four things here. There's one, two, three, and four. Yes. Can you go back to the So in this example, let's suppose we have a fixed number of them, a fixed number of examples, and we are tasked to find out the entire action. Yeah, that doesn't work. Uh, you wouldn't be able to do that. This is uh, uh, that's a very good question. Let's say you have a fixed data set, and you are asked, can you give me what uh, epsilon and delta work here? That doesn't quite work in this case. Um, you could. Um, basically, you, one thing you could do, for instance, is you can refactor this equation and bring epsilon uh, out and say the error is more than this quantity. But there are two variables here, right? De epsilon and delta. You, one thing you could do is you can train your classifier. And let's say you evaluate it on some test set. And you find that a certain epsilon, it has certain errors. And you want to know what's the probability that uh, uh, can you give some guarantee that future error will be less than that number? Then the only thing left is delta. So you can then calculate delta. Does that uh, will, will the calculation of delta be uh, computationally like, No, it's over the amount of delta i, uh, the higher energy will be the computation. Of... I don't understand the question. So uh, I guess I'm, I'm not sure if I'm correct, uh, correctly understanding this because. Uh, you say that 95% uh, uh, chance of learning no happens. So 0 0.05 will be the delta. And yes. So if we lower the delta, since there are two variables, so delta and uh, 
is there a uh, like a connection between the delta value and the epsilon value? Of course, there is, right? Give, uh, so let's say that given, a, so let's say you free that and let then increasing epsilon will, uh, sorry, decreasing epsilon, making the error tighter will make your confidence low. And similarly, demanding a higher confidence uh, will, because in some sense, these two multiply with each other. So increasing one will decrease the other for the same M. Yeah, that's the question. Yes. Okay, so we have three CNMs, a different class of functions. And now the goal is to see if they're pack learnable. The recipe is the same. Given a class of functions to see if it's pack learnable, all you have to do is count how many functions there are. So there's a question on Zoom, how many conjuncts can we have? And in fact, that's the question I'm going to ask you in a bit. But the real question is uh, with pack, le pack learnability, we are always asking, what is the sample complexity? If you have n features and you demand a certain epsilon error when you uh, insist that your guarantee of learning with high prob the probability of uh, having epsilon error is should be less than, um, sorry, more than one minus delta, how many examples do you need? In other words, how many examples do you need to guarantee pack learnability? Assuming, of course, there's a consistent learn. For that, all we need is to count this expression here. How many functions exist? So we need the size of the hypothesis space. So that's pretty much all we need to do. Count how many 3 CNFs exist. I'm going to walk you through this. Did you have a question? Okay. Uh, so I'm going to walk you through this uh, process in a bit, but uh, let me pause for questions. I want to find that involved. No, you're not going to give me the answer uh, yet because I am still a little concerned that people don't under, have questions about uh, the concept of a 3CNS. So people understand 3CNS. And rather than giving me the answer, can someone tell me how you would approach this question? Yes. Okay, so my thinking is uh, um, look at the small part, like the first one. The, so uh, it has uh, three three slots. Yeah, connected with the uh, conjunction. And with a disjunction. Yeah, yeah. Not a conjunction. Okay, a disjunction. And then so we have totally n elements. So here we can like uh, choice uh, three elements from n. So each of these things is called a conjunct. And the question on Zoom also is exactly that. How many conjuncts are there? And what's your answer? Uh, you have, you're saying there are three slots. Because three slots. Yes. And then they're joined so we, by an uh, R. Yeah, we have total in an um, element. So we can like uh, choose the three elements from N. Um. And maybe you choose to put X2 here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, then for these uh, three elements, uh, for each one, actually you have uh, three cases. The first case is, is uh, that as we see xi, the second case is uh, negative xi, the third case is empty, similar to. Okay. Yeah. And then through this uh, logic train, we can get the, uh, like, uh, choose the three elements from n, and each n could have uh, three cases, and then total to multiply them together, get the answer. That, that's my... That is for the number of conjuncts, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, your reasoning is right. I think you made it a little more complicated than necessary. There's a simpler way to get to the same answer. Can someone else tell me if there's a simpler way to get to the same answer, or how? Yes. Can we repeat what are also the That's a good thought. If I can put an X1 here and an X1 here, what is X1 or X1? X1. It's just X1. The function X1 or X1 is just X1. Repeating it is unnecessary. If you repeat it, you may overcome. Right. Within a conjunct. Across the conjunct? Yeah. Yes, you can. You're allowed to repeat them. Yeah. Thank you.
N choose three. So N choose three. And that's kind of like what you had suggested. So it's one possibility is N choose three. It turns out this answer is correct in the order of magnitude, but it's not correct in a in the actual count. And technically speaking, all we care about is order of magnitude, so this is going to be okay. But I want to be a little more precise. Yes? Uh, I would extend to the elements like the we can choose the, the, the S to I also the next I. So like, uh, for M to select kind of like uh, uh, two, 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 one by N and then just like uh, from two, one, two, two N plus one take three. Yeah. So the other option is two N plus one, choose three. Yeah. And the reason for that is at each position, you can choose either a literal or its negation or nothing. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Almost right. Almost, almost right. There's a slight technicality. I'll tell you what that is. Um, and it turns out that I'm not going to go into the technicality, but there's a slight technicality here, which is um, you're on, there's no point in repeating x1 one and not x1. If you put x, if I choose x1 in that position, let me move this out. So so these are the two possibilities. If I choose x1 in that position, I don't want to choose x1 again. I also don't want to choose not x1. If you do simply 2n plus 1, choose 3. So let me explain why 2n plus 1. There are n variables. Each position can be filled either with a variable or its negation. So there are two n possible things. There's a bucket of two n possible things from which we can pick an item to fill into this slot. And we are not going to do any repetitions. We are not allowed repetitions. So if I choose x1, I can't choose x1. So what we are really looking for is combinations. We are not allowed repetitions, but here there's a little bit more. Not only are we not allowed repetitions, we are also not allowed to use a negation because x1, what is the value of x1 or not x1? One. It's true. Yeah. A variable or its negation, of course, one of them is going to be true. So there's no point in choosing not x1. On the other hand, that empty thing, right, where I am allowed to ignore a certain position and say nothing goes there, is allowed to repeat all three times. So it makes the counting a little bit more complicated is what I'm getting. On the other hand, let's not care. Let's choose to not care because all we need is the order of magnitude. And 2n choose 3 or 2n plus 1 choose 3 is sufficient. So there are there is a bucket of 2n plus 1 things. Every variable, all its negations, and then that one thing that says this slot is empty. And in each position, I'm going to pick one of those things. So And I, need, I have three things to choose. So I have 2n plus 1 choose 3. This is kind of an, uh, not a precise count because of uh, all the, the, the reasons I just described. But this is good enough because let's kind of expand this. This is 2n plus 1 times 2n minus 1 times 2n minus 3 divided by 6. Right? Let's not expand all of this. This is really order of 2n cubed. That's really what we care. In fact, it's order of n cubed. The only thing we care about is it is cubic. Why? Because all we care about is that it's polynomial. It could be n cubed to n cubed, n to the 4, n to the 51, doesn't matter. It's not 2 power n. As long as it's not exponential, they're okay. So precisely here, it is the number of conjunct, the number of things you can use to fill up these boxes is order of n cube or order of 2n cube. But that doesn't give us a 3CNF. The number of conjuncts is order of 2n cube. But a 3CNF is a collection of conjuncts. You have, you know, for you have, let's now, this is a slightly different counting argument. I have these many conjuncts. I'm going to name them. So this is conjunct number one, which is just x1 n2, which is x1 and or x2 and so on. I have 
tangent number to n cubed, which is something. I have all of these. I need to build a big conjunction with all of them. For each one of them, that can show up in the final 3 pn act or not. I have two n cube things, and each one of them can either show up or not to define a 3 pnf by con con considering all possible combinations. The number of 3 CNFs is 2 power 3, uh, two, 2 power uh, 2 n cubed. This is uh, one of the more complicated counting arguments that we will see in the class. And if you ask me why is this going to help, will this make you better at machine learning? Will this make you a better person? I'm not sure. Uh, it's uh, it's fun. Is all my answer is in for a certain definition of that word. But are there any questions? I would like you to try to reconstruct this argument later. Yes. So, uh, this CNF only has two projections. No, it can have any number. It can have any number of them. There's three disjunctions. There are at most three disjunctions, uh, and there are any number of conjuncts. Two to the power, because Forget about three CNFs. Yeah. Let's consider just monotone conjunctions. Just a simple, you know, I have I have n variables. How many monotone conjunctions are there? How do you count the number of monotone conjunctions? Two to the n, right? Instead of n variables, imagine I have these many variables because a three CNF is nothing but a monotone conjunction over these things. It's exactly the same way you count monotone conjunctions. It's just the number of things that can form a conjunction is cubic. Anyway, the, the, the punchline here is rather simple. The order of the log of the factor of the hypothesis space is order of n cubed. That's really what matters. And because the log of the hypothesis size of the hypothesis space is polynomial in the dimensionality, we are done. This is a, this uh, function class is pack learnable. Um, there's a question about, can I explain the 2, one plus, 2n plus 1 thing again? How did this plus 1 show up? Because, I'll erase this part here. Let's build a letter. Let's build a conjunct. I have something or something or something. In this position, I can put an x1 or an x2, xn, not x1, not x2, not xn, or leave it empty. Because the definition of the 3CNF is at most 3, not exactly 3. So each slot is allowed to be empty. So there are 2n plus 1 things that can go here. Once you choose one of those things, then you cannot choose that again. Um, you, you cannot choose a few things if you, depending on what you put there, you, there are a few things that can appear. But basically, in the loose sense, this is the bucket of things that we are using to fill up these three positions. And so that way, and there are three positions, so you have two n plus one, choose three. It's not very precise because you can choose empty three times, but you can't choose x1. And you can't put an x1 here and a not x1 here because that they uh, erase each other. So that that kind of makes things a little bit ugly. But it doesn't. The the the, the reason for two n plus one is because of the at most. In any case, what we have now is the log of the size of the hypothesis space is polynomial. As a result, the sample complexity, namely the number of examples uh, that you need. For that theorem to kick in is also polynomial. The sample complexity is polynomial in n, so this function class is pack learnable. This function class is pack learnable, but I haven't shown you an algorithm yet. All I have shown you is this class of functions is learnable if, uh, if there exists an algorithm that can 
be consistent with the data, data set, right? Let me just give you a, I'm not, without proof, I'm going to just say there exists an algorithm that can learn this. And it turns out that algorithm is not too hard to construct given what we already know, the given the elimination algorithm that we saw uh, in class. So I'll leave it as an exercise for you to come up with an algorithm. To prove pack learnability, you also need to show that there exists an efficient algorithm. I'll leave that as an exercise. One more function class. Let's now consider all possible Boolean functions. How many Boolean functions are there? If you have n features, how many Boolean functions are there? It's two power, two power n. We've been seeing this enough number of times that I'm not going to explain this argument. They are two power, two power n Boolean functions. What's the log of that? It's still two power n. Log of the size of the hypothesis space is exponential. General Boolean functions are not fact known. So we have seen this argument multiple times now. It turns out if you apply the halving algorithm bound here, there also log of the size of the hypothesis space is the only thing that matters. Even with this theorem, log of the size of the hypothesis space is what matters. That it seems like that's a fundamental sort of a property of hypothesis spaces that keeps coming up in determining the difficulty of learning it. And in both these criteria, um, general Boolean functions are not learnable. Yes. When I say general Boolean functions, I mean all possible Boolean functions, any Boolean functions, as opposed to a subset, like what we saw before. 3 TNF is a subset. Conjunctions are a subset. Monotone conjunctions are even a smaller subset. And since you asked what are other Boolean functions, here are some examples. I can generalize three CNFs to KCNF. Instead of three, I just have K. A conjunction with uh, any number of clauses, any conjunct is called a class, uh, where each class has uh, at most K littles. K class CNF is basically, uh, there are, you know, it doesn't really matter. Uh, the, I'm going to let you read this offline. There are general Boolean uh, there are uh, uh, named sets of functions that are well studied. They have very clear definitions of what they are. You can read the definition, and in each case, you should be able to, uh, you know, build a counting argument that says how many functions are there. And in each case, looking at the log of that number of functions, you can check whether it's fact learnable or not. K class CNF. I'll just explain this because, uh, um, or actually, I'll, uh, there's uh, something called a K DNF. A KDNF is just like a DNF stands for disjunctive normal form. Everything that was an AND in a CNF becomes an OR. Everything that's an OR in a CNF becomes an AND. That's a disjunctive normal form. A KDNF is the analog of a KCNF. This class is an interesting one, K term DNF. I'll explain that in a bit. A K term DNF is a disjunction of at most K conjunctive terms. So I can have k boxes, let's say k equals 4, I have uh, t1, t2, t3, t4, and I put an or between them, so k equals 4. And then here I can have any conjunction. I have one conjunction or another conjunction or another conjunction or another conjunction. If I have exactly at most four of them, then it's called a four-term DNF. I have at most 15 of them, I'll have a 15 term here. It's just a class of functions. I mean, why do you why do people care about these classes of functions? Because we can prove things about it. Um, that's my best answer, honestly. The good news, if if it matters, if all of these are fact learnable, and the even better news is that you should be able to do the counting. How do you do the counting? You just uh, have to think of the three uh, CNF case similar sort of accounting argument you'll have to extend it. All four classes of functions have polynomial sample complexity, which is amazing. Why? Because it could make a good homework question, it could make a good exam question and such things. Um, but there's actually something more fun here. Let's focus on this class of functions. It's called, in, in fact, let's focus on something, a special case of that called a two-term DNF. A two-term DNF says 
I have something or something else. And this is a conjunction. And this is also a conjunction. And there can be at most two of them, meaning simple conjunction or another simple conjunction is a two-term DNF. A simple conjunction by itself is also a two-term DNF because it's a one-term DNF. So imagine that we have, uh, let's say that nature comes to you and says, I'm going to choose a concept, concept from this class of concepts, a two-term DNF, and I'll give you a data set, do your worst. Learn this concept. So to start things off, you need to pick a hypothesis space. What hypothesis space would you pick? Nature has told you that this is a concept class. This is not a trick question. What's, the, what's your best guess? If you have to learn a conjunction, what class of functions would you study? What class of functions would you want your learner to explore? Yeah. You can do that, but let's uh, play the game for, uh, for, let's play the spirit of the game. Um, you're right. I mean, if you're learning conjunctions, of course, you can use a linear classifier. But this expression is not linearly separate, a two-term DNA. You're always learning a binary classifier. The question really is, what hypothesis space should your learner explore if your, if your true function is in that set? The, way, the, the question I'm really asking is, imagine that I lose my keys in a park. Where am I searching for my keys? In the park, right? The true function belongs to the set of K term, two term DNFs. What should your learner search? Two term DNFs. It seems like a reasonable thing to do, except not. Uh, I said it's not a trick question, it is. It turns out there is a theorem that says searching this class of two term DNFs is computationally prohibited. Even if you know that your function belongs to that set, searching that set to find the one that's consistent with your data is intractable, which means it, it, it's actually NP hard, which means even though the sample complexity is polynomial, meaning the sample is learnable according to sample complexity, according to computational complexity, this class of functions is not efficiently learnable because it's impossible to search and efficient. Mm -hmm. To give you, to kind of build on that park analogy, if you lose your keys in the park, it's very hard to search the park, so you search the entire city that contains the park because it's very hard to search the park. Mm -hmm. It turns out that every two-term DNF actually is a subset of KCNFs. And we, in an exercise question, I said it's possible to construct a uh, learning algorithm for KCNFs. I'm not going to go through the construction here. Every a K term DNF can, if you if your true function belongs to K term DNFs, the answer is search the set of KCNFs and you'll find an answer. So if your concept class is inside, if your concept class is that red circle and your true function belongs to that red circle, it's very hard to search that red circle. So you search a space that's much bigger than that and you can efficiently find the correct answer. This is, huh? and this is one more, one more of those counterintuitive results that shows up because of weirdnesses of combinatorics. Combinatorial search can be very, very tricky as you have more and more constraint spaces. Losing the constraint, you know that the answer is there, you're going to find the answer. And this is an important lesson. Sometimes concepts that can be learned in one representation that cannot be learned in one representation may be learned in a larger class that contains those learning. Okay, we are at the end of uh, time. Just want to note that we've already seen this argument before with linear classifiers and conjunctions as came up before. We'll stop here. Um, everything till here is fair game for the midterm.